This is the shocking way that Louis C.K. became a legend. I had been going in a circle that didn't take me anywhere. Nobody gave a shit who I was, and I didn't either. I honestly didn't. Since then, I've done three comedy specials, and I've started down the same road. It's been a massive change for me. Louis C.K. is undoubtedly one of the greatest comedians to ever live. In fact, if you ask enough comedy fans, some of them would probably tell you Louis C.K. is the greatest of all time. However, the path to becoming a comedy phenom was not always a smooth ride for Louis. In fact, very early on in his career, Louis struggled a lot and didn't really have a light bulb moment with stand-up comedy until around 15 years into his career. If you're interested in finding out about the story of Louis C.K. and how he found his unique comedic voice and became legendary, then you've come to the right place. I will be discussing Louis C.K.'s path from starting out as a young comedian all the way to his monumental success in this video. If that sounds interesting to you, then let's hop right into it. To begin with, Louis C.K. started stand-up comedy when he was just 18 years old and his first open mic ever was at Stitches Comedy Club. His first set was really rough and he tells the story of how hard it was for him i'll show a short clip here and then i went on stage and i did about two minutes because i didn't have enough material like i just ran i sputtered my whole throat constricted and my i heard this roaring in my ears my eyes were watering my um heart was pounding and i couldn't control myself I couldn't think straight, and all these adults, like drinking adults, were looking at me like I'm an idiot, and I just walked off stage to kind of confused, like, little applause, <laughs> and I just felt like a pile of garbage. Then the second time he went up was because of a comedian named Kevin Meany. Louis worked at a video store and Kevin would often come in and talk with him. He told Kevin he did an open mic at Stitches Comedy Club and then Kevin said he wanted Louis to come and perform on his show. I'll let Louis tell the rest of the story but it's quite traumatizing. And he said oh you gotta come do my show and he had a show called the Sweeney Meany Show which was the biggest show in Boston. He said you gotta come, come on my show and I said oh, I've only done it once and it was bad. Let, let me get good at it. And he goes, no, 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 I only want, I want you now. Because uh, it, it's comedy tragedy. I want to watch, I want to watch you bomb <laughs> on my show. Him and Sweeney did this We Are the World thing that it was just destroyed. And then they brought me on. And I equally, more, worsely bombed. And I just... I can't describe how horrible that, that felt. Needless to say, this experience made it incredibly difficult for Louis to continue stand-up comedy, so he took around a year-long break from performing. On a side note, when comedians start out, it usually takes anywhere from 10 to 15 years for them to find their unique comedic voice on stage. It's important to note that 10 to 15 years is not set in stone, and every comedian will find their voice at a different time in their career. Sometimes it could be much sooner than this. For example, Anthony Jeselnik found his voice just two years into his comedy career after telling a dark one-liner and realizing that being unlikable was his cup of tea. However, finding your voice this soon as a comedian is quite rare, and ultimately the thing that decides how fast you find your voice is how often you get on stage and perform. Given the fact that Louis took a break from comedy after his bad show at Stitches with Kevin Meany, it would mean that he still had a lot more open mics and shows to perform at before he had a better idea of who he truly was on stage. Louis has told the story of how when he started doing comedy, he really didn't know what to talk about as a young 18 year old kid and how his go-to initially was just funny thoughts and things he noticed in his day-to-day -day life. There's a clip of him talking about this. My third time on stage I had really big laughs and other comedians came up to me and said hey you're funny you got something and I was so excited that I had a little foot in the door that this is something I could maybe do. And I thought it's me being kind of weird the way I am in real life. I'm, I like to say things that don't make a whole lot of sense or surprise people a little bit. What is it that you were doing on stage that they had a positive reaction to you? I was doing more kind of contemplative weird jokes. I, I did. I don't think I did things that were self-reflective. I did things that were just like... So even though Louis was still finding his unique comedic voice, he had made the conscious decision to take a step towards observational comedy with this set. He would then proceed to do these types of offbeat jokes that were more or less just funny ideas or situations he encountered. However, according to Louis, they lacked the self-reflection and depth that 
that would be present in his later work. There's a very early video of Louis C.K. performing stand-up comedy in 1988, which was just three years into his stand-up comedy career. If you watch this video, you can see that Louis hadn't really settled in on stage yet, and that there were several instances of him rushing his cadence quite a bit. This isn't to say that all the premises and jokes are underdeveloped or weak. There are legitimately funny jokes in this set, but they don't all land flush quite yet because Louis is still finding his timing and not utilizing pauses to his advantage. I'll show you an example of what I mean right here. Good, I'm doing okay. Actually, I just got over the flu, which was kind of crappy, but the worst part is that I smoke. And I think that's what the stupidest you feel about being a smoker is when you're sick and you still smoke, you know? No matter how sick you are. I mean, you can wake up in the morning, you're coughing up little furry animals, you know? You're, you're coughing up tickets to the ice capades, but you'll force yourself to smoke all day long no matter how much it hurts. That's when you realize smoking, it's like taking a cheese grater and going, well, this will probably really hurt, but ah, uh, oh, what the hell, you know? It's, uh... <laughs> The cheese grater punchline is a genuinely funny analogy for what he's talking about, but you can tell there's a couple of points where he could have paused in the beginning, and if he had done that and relaxed his cadence a little bit, he could have found several more laugh points before he even got to the final punchline. But the performance anxiety you experience as a comedian diminishes with the more experience you get. This is something comedians struggle with starting out, is taking your time and sitting in the pocket, and being comfortable with silence. Most of the time when a comedian starts out at open mics, you only get around five minutes to do material, sometimes less. A lot of New York open mics can be as short as two to three minutes. So in that short window of time, there's a lot of pressure to try all the different jokes and material out you want to without running the light. So I think for a lot of younger comedians, it just takes a little bit of experience and maturity to start to sit back in the pocket and relax while you're performing on stage. I want to emphasize that I don't think this old set from Louis is bad given his experience level on stage being only about two to three years, and also the fact that Louis is probably only 21 years old. Most young guys in their early 20s, including myself, are still finding our voice as people and who we really are probably until 29 or 30 years old. So that in combination with being a novice comedian on the stage really is a lot to find. However, Louis still has some genuinely goofy moments in this set, like when he talks about the concept of shushing people. Now I think we have some strange methods that I never understood. Like when somebody wants you to be quiet, what do they usually do? Yeah, they make this noise. They go, shh. Now what the hell is that anyway? I mean, there's nothing about that particular noise that makes me want to shut up when I hear it. So how to get to be the official shut up noise anyway? If it had to be some random noise, instead of going shh, why don't they go ah? Bluffness! <laughs> that would make me shut up. It's like, what the hell is your, you know? Even if you don't find this particular bit funny, within this bit you can start to see an inkling of the comedian that we would come to know and love many years later. He's questioning something that he's observed with his own eyes, and from there, he's postulating the reasoning for it and suggesting alternatives to it that would make more sense similar to George Carlin in his early days of observational comedy. Furthermore, establishing that early in Louis' career, he struggled to utilize pauses, had a very rushed and chaotic cadence, and that he wasn't really diving into the topics he truly wanted to talk about deep down, Louis would keep trying, as all great comedians do, and eventually something would change for him. Louis himself talks about this change quite vividly in his speech where he pays homage to George Carlin. This speech took place at the New York Public Library in March 2010 during a tribute to the late great George Carlin just two years after his death in 2008. Louis talks about how in the beginning he kept trying to do comedy and initially his jokes were just those funny and goofy thoughts that we saw in the old video of him from 1988. He talks a little bit about this here and how he felt quite dissatisfied with the jokes because he felt that they weren't important to him and subsequently through that they weren't important to the audience either. And I learned how to write jokes and I just had jokes, kind of funny thoughts and I about, I don't know, 15 years later I, <laughs> I had been going in a circle that didn't take me anywhere. Nobody gave a sh who I was, and I didn't either. Louis also talks about how he had been doing the same hour of comedy for 15 years, and how he really felt scared to do anything other than his old material. He then proceeds to talk about how one night after a gig, he sat in his car and listened to a George Carlin interview, where he talked shop and his creative process. One of the points that Louis hyper-focused on was George's ability to put out a new special every single year, which is a strategy of comedy that would become popularized by George Carlin, Richard Pryor, and then later on Louis C.K. as well. I'll let Louis share this discovery of George's process and how it affected him personally. I'm listening and they ask him, um, how'd you, how'd you, how do you do all this material? And I'm like, eh. and I, and I hear him and he says, well, I just decided every year I'd be working on that year's special. 
and I'd do the special, and then I'd just chuck out the material, and I'd start again with nothing. And I thought, that's crazy. How do you throw away? It took me 15 years to build this shitty hour. If I throw it away, I got nothing. He gave me this, the courage to try, and also I was desperate. What the so George gave Louis the courage to leave his old act behind and start diving into the topics that Louis really wanted to talk about deep down. He also talks about this and how he eventually found some gold very early on in his journey of building a new act. I was having a lot of hard, uh, hard time being a father. And I wanted to say it on stage. And one night I just, I thought, okay, forget all the old jokes. I'm going to start again. And I thought of the first thing. I said, I can't have sex with my, do with my daughter, with my wife, <laughs> because we have a baby and our baby's a fucking asshole. It's just what I was feeling and I said it. And the audience went, whoa. And I thought, oh, I'm somewhere new now. And I said uh, something like, I never used to get babies in the garbage, but now I understand it. And they did that. And I thought, I'd rather have that than the shit tepid laughter for my 15 year old jokes. So this new path that Louis was on was where he really wanted to be all along. He was talking about stuff that was truly authentic to himself and his situation on stage. And this is where he started to get some of his biggest laughs to date. Not to mention that despite not liking his act for the first 15 years of his career, he did gain a lot of valuable experience learning how to have a confident stage presence, a strong unwavering delivery, and how to write and structure jokes, tags, and callbacks that he could now utilize that skill set with the subject matter that was genuinely interesting interesting to him. This is when Louis's career would really start to take off and people started to deeply resonate and love what he did on stage. So this was when Louis CK truly found his unique comedic voice and this is always what has made him such a special comedian is his ability to tread incredibly dark and personal subjects in a manner that is fully digestible for regular people. That's what his TV show Louis is. It's a plethora of awkward, weird, and dark situations that Louis himself has experienced and is deeply ruminated about that thoughtfully highlight the pure ugliness and beauty of the human experience. It's these themes that are so raw and real that made so many people come to love Louis C.K. and his deep body of work. Louis has also talked about how when he does a special, he will repeatedly do this process of chucking out his old material and how throwing away his best tools forces him to exert even more tools from himself. He also compared building a new hour of comedy to making a katana, and I think this analogy is particularly brilliant. Yeah, specials are something. It's to me. I used to describe it like a, um, the way they make samurai swords, or used to. Yeah. That they bang it and then fold it and then bang it again and yeah. then they fold it and keep banging it. So every time you think I've got an hour, no, you don't. Yeah. Write another hour and then yeah, fold it into it. that one. And, and then get rid of all the impurities and all the bad stuff and then keep doing that. So this method really helps Louis write new material to the best of his ability. And he used this to put out some of the best comedy specials that the world has ever seen, along with an Emmy Award winning TV show that was canceled for some reason. I don't know why. Some people have tried to take away Louis's legendary status ever since he got in trouble for the whacking incident, and that's a load of horse shit. Just because you did some weird stuff in your past does not take away from the body of work that existed before the public exile took place. Not to mention, even after all that, Louis came back with Sincerely and showed the world that he is still a formidable force of comedy, and despite his mishaps and mistakes, he has not devolved even a little bit as an artist. When your ability to write a great hour of comedy stands through thick and thin, and supersedes a bad reputation, and your legendary status is reclaimed the second you step back on the stage, it's safe to say that you're a comedy legend. Plain and simple. I know in this video I said I'd tell you how Louis became a legend, and I talked about how he found his comedic voice, but I think there's a legitimate argument for Louis's unique comedic voice contributing greatly to Louis becoming one of the greatest comedians of all time. His raw honesty and reflection on his past and his own thoughts is truly immaculate and one of a kind. All of the reasons I've listed, and so many more along with the long road to the top, have cemented Louis C.K. as a comedy legend who is without a doubt one of the greatest comedians and artists to ever walk the face of the planet. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. All in all, this was the shocking way that Louis C.K. became a legend. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching the video all the way to the end. I appreciate it. If you want to help the channel out, make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on those post notifications down below, because that's a free way to support the channel, and you're helping my community grow brick by brick, one subscriber at a time. 
I'd like to hit 100,000 subs this year. I think we can do it. So please help me out by subscribing down below. And if you want to support me further, you can check out my Patreon page down below. I just posted a video recently where I talk about how I make my videos. You also get to see every video early and you get shout outs every video as well. Real quick, shout out to all my patrons. We got Thomas Gill, Jay Murray, Crossblocker, Ethan, Karsten Brevik, Eduardo Ramos, Darren Lester, Jack Morgan, and newly Olga B. Thank you guys so much for supporting me on the Patreon. I really appreciate that. But yeah, guys, hope you have a great day. Take care of yourselves, your friends, your family, and your loved ones. I love you, and I'll see you in the next video. Take care.